Welcome to part two of this video series where we're reading through and learning how to play against the Dark Master. In this video, we will get into the rules for adventuring. So, all right, then we get into adventuring. Our basic way of resolving some type of skill is to make an open-ended D100 roll and adding the character's relevant skill bonuses plus any possible modifier. Pretty straightforward. Each particular thing that you're trying to accomplish has a difficulty, and I think this is interesting. When a skill roll is called, the game master must determine how difficult the task being attempted is and choose a difficulty for it. Okay, but that's not uh, so different from other things. The different part here is that the higher the difficulty, rather than having some type of number you're trying to roll over, the higher the difficulty, the higher the negative modifier associated with it. There's no theoretical limit to the difficulty of a skill roll and thus to the penalty associated with it. However, you can follow the, the guidelines in the table to quickly assess the difficulty and determine the inherent modifier of the action attempted. So let's see here. Uh, action res That's not what we need to look at right now. We need to look at here. This is skill roll difficulty table. So we've got standard, challenging, hard, very hard, extremely hard, heroic, or insane. And so these are the modifiers that are associated with it right here and then some type of description for it. So, then you're going to apply your role to this table up here. I told you this was a table-based game, which is action resolution table. So, you know, your open-ended role, plus your modifier, plus or minus any extended circumstances modifier. You know, your skill modifier, plus circumstantial modifiers, minus the difficulty of the task. So if you're trying to do a very hard task, that's a task challenging even for a skilled character and possibly requiring some luck to be accomplished, that's at negative 30. You total up your entire roll, and that's when you go to this action resolution table, and there you go. Your results are critical failure, failure, partial success, success, or outstanding success, depending on the total amount that you rolled. So that's interesting. If you memorize this or have this table standing by, which is better that this is one action resolution table rather than having like MURPS moving maneuver table and static maneuver table and, and all these different kinds of tables. This is just the table that you consult for any type of action. Critical failure, you don't get what you were trying to obtain and you put yourself in danger, break a piece of equipment, take twice the normal time required, or grant your foes a plus 20 bonus on their next roll against you. You don't get what you're trying to obtain Partial success, you only partially accomplish what you were trying to do or manage to do it with a cost, complication, or trouble. So this is also something that's become more common in uh, modern role-playing, this idea of, okay, you partially accomplish it, or you can do it, but the game master or everyone at the table has to come up with a cost, a complication, or a trouble. If you roll, now this is easy, I suppose, to remember because I'm looking at this right here, and this is 100. So if you roll after all of that 100 or more, you accomplish what you were trying to do. And if you roll 175 or more, you accomplish what you were trying to do, and you get a plus 20 bonus to your next related roll. So I suppose, what is this, four or less is critical failure. So you're looking, your thresholds are five, to 75, 74. So once you're at 75, you, you might be in some type of window, 100 and you're good, 175 and you're, you're really good. So probably those numbers would stick with you as you play. Uh, I think we can go past all of that. Uh, save, roll. Oh, I did think this was interesting that, okay, when a save is, is called for, when you need to save yourself something from something, either because of something affecting your toughness or your willpower, you must make an open-ended roll and then add your save bonus, plus any applicable modifier as always. If the final result is higher than the save roll difficulty, the save is successful and you resist. The standard difficulty of a save roll is 50, plus five times the attack level of the effect the character is trying to resist to avoid. So here is this situation where level matters, and that does seem to be brought forward from MURP, because, you know, in MURP we were looking at a bunch of different uh, tables which you contrasted, you know, your level with the level of your foe to give you different levels of experience points or things like that. So here we also have this idea of you're trying to save yourself something from something and you have a particular level and then the attack also has a particular level and obviously if you're being attacked by a higher level attack then than you are then it's going to be more difficult to resist so the standard difficulty of a save roll is 50 plus five times the level of the attack oh so that's what it's showing you over here so if you are being attacked by a level six thing 
then your difficulty that you are trying to roll over is 80. So you'd also want to have the save roll modifier table with you, and I suppose with everybody, because you'd say, all right, this is a level 7 attack, so it's going to be 85, but you are a level 4 character, so you get a plus 20, right? In addition to everything else. I think I, having both of these on the same table uh, kind of implies something different to me, but this is definitely supposed to be interpreted, I believe, as basically two different tables. The attack level over here sets your difficulty, but then your defender level gives you a bonus to your roll. We do have some information on magic and spells here. We have a spell casting table. We're going to be rolling dice. Uh, and here is our, you know, spell failure, partial success, and different levels of success for each spell. The character may attempt to cast any spell they know, provided they have enough magic points, and the weave of the spell isn't higher than the character's level. I think we're about to see a bunch of different spell lists, which is what they're going to call this weave with a bunch of different levels. So if you're a level, you know, two character, you can cast up to the level two or something like that. I believe that's where we're going. We've got casting time, including concentration here, and improvised spells. While risky, it's also possible to completely forego preparation casting a spell without concentrating first. So I think you're actually supposed to concentrate. So most spells take a single action to cast. See the combat chapter for more information. But the character may concentrate on a spell to enhance their chances of success. To concentrate, the caster must spend a full round action focusing on the spell they're preparing, chanting, or drawing arcane symbols in the air. Each round spent this way gets a plus 10 bonus to the spell casting roll, up to a maximum plus 40. I do like that. You know, one of the things that I don't like about Dungeons & Dragons is that is that most spells are just one action and then you do it at the end of that action. And of course, there are some things that you can do as a, as a bonus action or a free action or whatever, which probably comes from my early influence of Merp that some spells might take more than one round to cast, or if you spend enough time chanting and actually preparing the spell, you're going to be more likely to cast it. So I like that here. So that helps you out and to be more successful casting spells. I like that. On the other hand, you may need to do this improvised spell thing, which is when I got to get this off and I don't actually have time to actually prepare it. Now, that also does mean that spells can be more powerful because, you know, if a fighter is going to be attacking every round with a sword or a spear or somebody's going to be shooting a bow or whatever else, the bow may take more than one round to reload. But, you know, the, the spells then need to have more impact than the fighter swinging the sword if the character playing the the spellcaster is going to spend uh, one, two, three, or up to four different uh, rounds concentrating on a spell in order to get it off. It also means the rounds need to play faster so the uh, the caster isn't just standing there or sitting there at the table for four, you know, that's like you know 30 minutes or something like that in order to actually do something. That's a gameplay thing. But on the other hand, if you're not uh, going to be concentrating, spells cast this way are called improvised spells and impose a special penalty of negative 10 to the spell casting roll. I like that. If you really need to get this spell off now, there is a way to do that, but with more risk. Instantaneous spells, spells marked as instantaneous, gain no benefit from concentration, but can be improvised without incurring the normal negative 10 on our cast as half actions. So that's your fast spell casting. So I do like that division. I really do. Now, I haven't gone into detail on what all the spells are, but potentially I like that division. Spell casting in armor. Mages usually shun armors as their weight uh, provides distraction to those not accustomed to it. Armor movement penalty applies to spell casting rolls. Okay, so there's your mechanical reason why wizards probably aren't wearing a lot of armor. Okay, so in order to cast the spell, you must uh, make this open ended roll like normal on the spell casting table, adding total skill bonus for the spell lore used plus any modifier. A modified roll of 25 or less results in a critical spell failure, which means the spell casting fails, and the player must roll on the critical spell failure table. Uh-oh. A roll of 26 or more means the spell was successfully cast and must be immediately resolved, applying the additional effect described on the table for the obtained result. If the spell requires a save throw, the result column on the spell casting table will show the difficulty the target needs to beat on their save roll to resist its effects. So let's go back up and look at that. So if you roll up to 25, it's a failure. Okay. 26 to 50, partial success. If the spell requires a save throw, the targets automatically succeed on their save roll against it. Otherwise, choose one that applies best. 
The spell duration is reduced to half of the original. The spell's area of effect is reduced to half the original. The spell has no effect, but the caster retains magic points. Okay, interesting. So then this is the result here. If the spell does not require a saving throw, it succeeds. If the spell requires a save roll, read the difficulty of the save. Is that what this is supposed to be? Result here? Is that what it said? If a spell requires a save roll, the result column, that's kind of, why doesn't it just say the save? That, that You know, the resulting save or something. But, but okay, so the result column on the spell casting table will show the difficulty the targets need to beat on their save roll to resist its effects. Okay, so that's kind of different. Rather than saying the level of the caster, which seems to be a more merp thing, you know, okay, you, you've been a, you had a spell cast on you by a level of, uh, a caster of this particular level, here's your saving throw or something like that, based on your level as well, it's how well the caster rolled the spell roll, which is, I'm sure, influenced with its the modifiers by how a competent a caster is, which has to do with level, I would guess. But it's more directly the result of how high you can roll. And then 151, we get to bonus things. So I can tell this is a little bit difficult here because there's no way to tell... When am I getting into the extras? You're just going to have to consult every individual table. For some modern role-playing, that's potentially a negative. Because didn't we say that just like for general skill rolls, it was success from 100 up to 174, and then at 175, we got into extra special success. But then here on the spell table, it looks like um, 50, no, 51. 51 is your success, but then if you roll 151 or greater... So it's just different. If the spell does not require a save roll, it succeeds. If the spell requires a save roll, read the difficulty over here. Furthermore, the spell costs half the magic points to cast, or you can choose to add a warping option to the spell for free, providing that its cost is no more than half of your spell itself. I don't know what a warping uh, thing is right now. I'm sure we'll get to it. So bolt and area spells, okay. Casting spells modifier, oh, we got... So we've got improvised, like we were talking about, preparation, target is static, plus 10, okay. Ra oh, we got range modifiers here. Touching, plus 30, up to 3 meters, 4 to 15 meters. I actually really like this, because in Dungeons & Dragons, we typically have spells that have some type of range, or they must be touching, you know, or something like that, you know, a range of touch or other things. I see that a lot in different role-playing games. But I do like this which I believe was in Merp and now carried over here, that, well, just, you know, some healing spell could be cast on somebody farther away, but it's increasing your difficulty in doing that. So that's your range modifier. It's best to be touching somebody, but, you know, up to three meters away, I suppose that might be a hex away or something like that in many circumstances, you know, or, or a number of different hexes away. If you're using miniatures on a grid or something like that, you can cast any spell at a variety of different ranges. It just has to do with the difficulty of the spell. So I, I like that. I, it provides you extra flexibility. Uh, I am a fan of that. Oh, so here's our warping a spell. Some spells may be warped, which means a character can choose to cast them as a higher weave spell, obtaining a more powerful effect. Only spells with warping options in their descriptions may be warped. Each warping option may be selected multiple times until, unless the spell description prohibits explicitly doing so. The final weave of a warped spell is equal to the weave of the basic form of the spell plus the weave of the warping option chosen, and its MP cost changes accordingly. Okay. Magical resonance. The use of magic is never completely safe. Even the casting of the lesser cantrips creates a resonance, a ripple in the fabric of reality, which can attract the attention of dark powers and servants of shadow. Each time a character rolls a double result on the dice, like 11, 22, or 33, of the casting result, the GM makes a roll on the magical resonance roll table, adding the weave of the spell cast and the following modifiers. In a safe haven, blighted land, healing spell, dark spell. Okay, what happens? Oh, and then, oh, some stuff can happen with your magic. So magic is dangerous, much more dangerous than just swinging a sword. Like uh, awareness, the Dark Master is a, a Dark Master, I think, is like what their word for the Dark Lord, whatever the Dark Lord is in the setting. So everything seems to be set up to have a Dark Lord in the setting. Whatever that has to be, Sauron or whatever else. Attention, awareness, attention, pursuit, assault. The Dark Master has located the caster and will send a band of capable servants to destroy them. Spell failure. 
Whenever a character rolls a spell failure result on the spell casting table or on one of the spell attack tables, the spell automatically fails, and then you roll the spell on the spell failure table. So what can happen to you? Go off on somebody else. The spell goes off on a different target. The caster is stunned and chooses to. Okay. Now we go on to movement and traveling. And I did notice that as far as encumbrance goes, and I, I would love to talk about more ways to do encumbrance, but as far as encumbrance is concerned, Against the Dark Master goes with a more straightforward way of doing this. And I like having encumbrance in games, but I also don't want to have it take up so much time at the table and be measuring individual coins and things like this. So this is uh, an interesting way of doing it. It says that instead it uh, relies on the player's and GM's common sense in determining how effectively a character is cluttered. Encumbrance is measured in encumbrance levels, unencumbered, lightly encumbered, which means a negative 10 to all attacks and moving actions, encumbered, negative 20 to attacks and moving actions, heavily encumbered, negative 30, or over encumbered, moving at one quarter standard movement rate and cannot run, cannot attack, and cannot add their swiftness stat to their defense. So basically, pick one of these levels, and supposedly that this particular level is given to your common sense and mutual judgment according to what your character's encumbrance level is. A more robust character, perhaps a character factoring a total of 30 point bonus on their brawn and fortitude stats, can eventually decrease the encumbrance level by one, as well as larger sized characters such as a troll. So we've got some level of this, but not tremendous detail, and here's some way that we can avoid it. Although I did find that it was interesting that Armors are never considered when factoring a character's encumbrance level. Armors have their own inherent associated penalties to maneuvering, attacking, and general activities that you can find in the equipment chapter. Remember that any negative penalty to movement or attacks coming from armors always stacks with those associated to encumbrance. So that is a little bit inelegant, I think, from my first read through here. Because I would think if you're going to have this encumbrance level thing, you would want it to be all-inclusive for everything. But we have encumbrance, and then we have something that's very separate for armor. It's another thing to remember. So armor stacks with encumbrance, apparently, here. But armor is not encumbrance. So here's uh, some examples of what it means to be encumbered. So if you're encumbered, or you know, different levels of encumbrance. If you are encumbered, then clothes, a belt, a pouch, a heavy weapon, or two light weapons, a heavy backpack with one week of worth of rations, a bedroll, and various traveling equipment is encumbered. I do like that. And I believe there have been other RPGs I've seen which have even given you illustrations of what it means for different characters to be lightly encumbered or heavy. You know, pick the one that you know looks like what you look like. I, I think that's potentially a good way to do things. So traveling and hazards. I'm going to skip over a little bit of that for right now. Weariness and starvation. So we do have what happens to you when you don't eat or drink. Here is Overland Movement Table and then Random Hazards Table. This is also very reminiscent of MERP about uh, you know how far you can travel through normal, rough, or arduous terrain mounted or by foot and then kind of what happens to you in, in a, a random encounter kind of way. Wealth and Treasure. Now, I thought this was interesting because Against the Dark Master doesn't use coins like MERP did. Here's your tin coins, your copper coins, your gold coins, all of that. So instead we have a wealth level. A character's wealth level and social status are measured in wealth levels ranging from zero to five. Serf, struggling, commoner, gentry, lesser noble, or greater noble. And then that just allows you to buy certain things at different levels. And on the whole, I'm not totally against that either. I know some people really want to track exactly how many coins you spend in each each time. Like, oh, I'm going to go up and I'm going to give the the bartender some coins to get us some ale or some beer. Okay, well, let's find out exactly how much that is and mark off exactly that number of coins on your character sheet. I know some people do that, but on the other hand, you know, I, I'm interested a lot in storytelling. And when I'm telling stories, you know, either they're going to be able to go into the tavern and, and get some food and some beer or they're not, or they're going to have some type of, you know, problem because they can't or something like that. They're not, you know, tracking the number of coins in each character's uh, money purse. So I'm potentially okay with a wealth level. So any good or service, be it an item or a weapon or a horse or food and lodging or transportation has a fair value listed next to it in the equipment chapter. 
in the equipment chapter. When during the game there's a need to determine whether or not a character can afford to buy a particular good or not, you must compare the character's wealth level to the fair, good's fair level. Refer to the WL versus, where, versus fair chart below. WL is greater than fair, the character can afford buying the good. WL is equal to fair, the character can afford buying the good, but their wealth level is reduced by one. Wealth level is less than fair, the character cannot afford to buy that good with their finances loan. They must have someone loan them the money or otherwise increase, increase their wealth. And then here are some other modifiers. And then basically you can increase your wealth by finding treasure, which is definitely a major motivation for lots of adventurers. So if you find some type of treasure like this, a bag of silver coins or a small chest of gold pieces and or smaller jewelry, a fine art piece, a fine little gemstone, that is TV2. When a character finds treasure and are able to keep it, they must compare their current wealth level with the TV. Okay, so if you find treasure, then your wealth level is less than TV. The character, increase the character's wealth level to the TV. <laughs> Wealth level is equal to the TV, increase the character's wealth level by one. Character's wealth level is greater than the TV, no changes to character's wealth level. I'm sure there are a lot of players who won't like that because they want to track gold coins. But I can, I can see going with this. I can see going with this. I really can. Now here is character advancement, and I did notice that the experience points here in Against the Dark Master are very much simplified from MERP. If you've been through the videos I've done on MERP, there is a lot that goes into calculating experience points in MERP. There are a lot of different tables, and, and we looked at a bunch of them and a lot of different things that go into what it means to get an experience point in MERP. And I, so I was very pleased to see they simplified that here because I do think that was too much in MERP. Trying to, to calculate that and having whole experience points worksheets to try to calculate, I think that was too much. So here they've got um, that you're going to gain experience points by visiting new places, completing missions, and facing challenges. By gaining enough XPs, the character will level up, which means they can develop skills and abilities, so forth. So you're going to start at level 1 with 10 experience points, and then progress through 10 levels of experience during play, which is also probably fine, potentially. You know, instead of going through 20... Of course, what it, you know, how long it actually takes you to go through a level is arbitrary based on different games and so forth. But, okay, 10 levels is probably fine. From levels 1 to 5, characters will level up every 10 experience gained. So we're not gaining tens or hundreds of thousands of experience points. From levels 1 to 5, characters will level up every 10 experience points. Starting at level 6, improving oneself will become slightly more challenging and characters will need 10 experience points to reach a new level. So here is our experience point level. So how do you gain an experience point? So experience points are awarded at the end of each session. Each player, together with the GM and the others at the table, briefly review what happened. Their characters gain one experience point for each point in these lists the group agrees that happened at least once during the session. If some agreement can't be reached, the GM has the final say. So general experience. You travel to or explore a location you've never been before. You faced dangerous foes under difficult situations. You completed a quest or mission. You suffered a grievous wound or suffered a great personal failure. All of those get you an experience point. Vocation-based experience. Warrior. You slew a foe more powerful than you. Maybe you could interpret that as character level or something. I don't know. Your might or bravery solved the most critical situation in this session. Rogue. Your cunning or dexterity opened a new path when all seemed lost. You tricked an NPC more powerful than you. Wizard. You cleverly cast spells turned overwhelming... Maybe that's supposed to be your? Your cleverly cast spell turned overwhelming odds in your favor. Your academic knowledge granted you an edge in a challenging situation. Animist, your wisdom or healing art solved a desperate situation. You destroyed an unhallowed item or defeated an unnatural creature more powerful than you. Okay. So I think you probably could go through that list at the end of a session. Although at the end of the session, a lot of people need to go and things like that. But here's this other thing that you need to do before the session is over. Of course, although they are designed to be a bit fuzzy, I think that most people would be able to determine whether or not these things happened. And it is a rather small list, so you probably would be able to read them out and everybody could go yay or nay on what happened and whether or not you get uh, points for these things. I mean, you faced dangerous foes in our difficult situations probably every time, right? Uh, many times you'll probably travel to a place to explore. 
Sometimes you'll complete the quest or mission. I think everybody will know what the quest or mission is. Sometimes that's, you know, once per session. Sometimes it may take more than one session. Suffering a grievous wound. Now, we're going to get into critical hits and critical wounds later on. So I think, you know, based on you know, if everybody remembers that that happened to you, that's probably a grievous wound. And then probably, if you know if you're playing one of these different vocations that this is what it takes in order to get additional experience points, you're probably going to know and you're probably going to try to get them. So when a character levels up, increase their total magic points and gain a new set of development points for each skill category according to their vocation as shown on this. You can spend your new development points to buy ranks for their skills, uh, but you have to use them right now. So a warrior gets two for armor, five for combat, five, no, none for lore, spells, or, you know, two for body, none for lore, spells, or magic points. You know, that makes sense. Wizard over here, no armor, combat, but adventuring skills. So those are those ranks, right? Those are those ranks that you're going to be increasing? Yep, they can spend their new DPs to buy more ranks for their skills. All right, that's the end of the section on adventuring and against the Dark Master. In the next video, we'll get into the rules for combat, which is an eternal favorite I know. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and all that jazz, but also please check out my YouTube channel. I have over 100 videos already on the channel about tabletop games and fantasy, and if you enjoyed this video, you will likely also enjoy many of them as well. Thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you in many more videos to come. Later.